During his prime, Reggie Miller averaged an unassuming 21 points, 3 assists, and 3 rebounds per game. He only made 5 All-Star teams, which has led many people to view him as an overrated pseudo-star. He was an All-Star who occasionally, and memorably, could impersonate a superstar on a big stage. But what if he was so far ahead of his time that he was penalized for the very style that made him effective? What if that style laid the blueprint for a basketball revolution and actually made Reggie Miller one of the most impactful offensive players of his era? You are watching what greatness is all about. Where's Larry Bird in all this? Has it blocked by Elijah Wong? Michael Jordan <laughs> saves the day. The first season of Greatest Peaks was about the best of the best. But this time we're looking at trendsetters, unique archetypes, and even controversial players who make up the legends of NBA offense. Do you remember like the player that you would emulate when you were that age? Like so many kids now, it's like you for them. Like who was your model? The motto was Steve Nash and Reggie Miller. The three-point shot has become an enormous part of basketball, but it took a long time for coaches and players to realize just how efficient it could be. When Miller entered the league in 1998, Larry Bird held the career record for three-pointers made with 357. Steph Curry's made more in a single season. Among scoring leaders in the playoffs, Miller was one of the few who was bombing threes at modern rates back in the mid-90s. And the difference between his three-point shooting and the average top scorer then is similar to the difference between Curry's edge over the top scorers of his prime. Only, there was no concept that these shots were more valuable back then because raw field goal percentage was the standard for efficiency, and Miller was solid but unspectacular by that measure. No one noticed the difference between long twos and threes, so these two trips were merely seen as 50% field goal shooting instead of generating four points compared to the traditional two. Here's Hall of Famer George Gervin summarizing a generation that looked down on the three. That's a worst shot in basketball. The, the best three-point shooters shoot under 40% probably. Miller actually took a surprising number of long twos because he wasn't hyper-focused on stepping behind the line, instead coming off screens and organically firing from long range. Moving around like this was at the heart of Reggie's game, running around picks for shots, and you couldn't relax for a second because he'd find any opening. The Pacers are down three here in the final minute of this playoff game. Miller drives into a double team, kicks it out, and then tries to sprint over to the other side of the court to get open, only to cut back to the near side and find a little spot on the sideline to tie the game. In your heart! Reggie's not the first player to run around in circles and play catch me if you can. But Miller was the first movement-heavy shooter to use the three-point line well before it was in vogue. This is the exact same style Steph Curry used to unlock his off-ball value two decades later, running around as the centerpiece of the Warriors' motion-heavy offense into threes or backdoor cuts for layups. Miller was one of the best ever at finding soft spots in the defense and cutting into open space. He often started down on the baseline with the option to run off a weak side screen or use the screen right in front of him to come back and get it for a jumper. If his defender trailed him too wide around that pick, he could curl in for a drive to the basket. Then when the defender starts anticipating that cut, Reggie flies out to the other side, and in each of these situations, he's reading his defender and using their positioning against them to find an opening to attack. Watch what he does to Michael Jordan here. Faking to the near corner, Jordan doesn't bite, so Miller flares to the other side, only the pass never comes, and when Jordan goes under the screen, then Reggie heads toward the ball just to set him up for a back door into that tiny crease. Mm. 
players like Jordan did their damage with the basketball, rising right up over defenders or countering with the dribble, crossing over to change directions into a pull-up. But Miller's counters were off-ball, so they weren't as celebrated or as easy to notice. He's down on the baseline here to use a screen, and when Jordan shoots the gap, Miller just counters by flaring it to the corner for a wide open three. So in the final minutes of that game, Jordan's waiting for Miller to set up near the baseline, so Reggie just instantly pops out behind the three point line and drills a critical three. The timing of his cuts was also fantastic, spotted up in the corner on this very 1998 possession, then sneaking out of his defender's view so he could dart baseline and save the trip with a layup. This is all incredibly difficult to guard, yet it was looked down on back then because he was dependent on his teammates to pass him the ball, even though most of these are fairly basic passes. But I actually think off-ball players let teammates do more because they don't require the basketball, so they can stress defenses while someone else goes to work. Indiana sets up a pick and roll with Miller on the weak side here, and as the defense rotates, he repositions himself as a high-value target behind the three-point line. His shooting helped the Pacers' spacing, John Starks is hugging him instead of sagging off and helping, and that makes plays like this easier. In transition, Dennis Scott literally face guards Miller, he's so afraid of him, and suddenly it's an easy drive for Mark Jackson. And this is similar to the gravity we've seen from Curry, where opponents will glue a defender to him for an entire possession, willing to play four on four, or in transition, they'll literally move out of the way of ball handlers to chase him to the three-point line. Miller's gravitational force wasn't quite as severe as Curry's back then, in large part because of cramped spacing. A second defender jumps at him here, but there's an extra body in the lane, so Smits ends up popping for a jumper. But Reggie did create for teammates without the ball. They're down three in the final minute here, and this incredible cut, after passing, draws a defender away from the hoop and leaves Antonio Davis all alone. We've talked about Curry's screen gravity before, where defenders don't want to leave him because they're hyper-focused on his movement. And Miller's screens had a similar impact, occupying opponents instead of showing or switching to help. And like Curry, defenders were weary of guarding him traditionally, so they didn't always look at the ball because they were so worried about losing Reggie on a cut. We've seen Curry's movement tug defenders off handoffs, where a teammate can keep it and spring free for a layup. And Miller had that same gravitational effect, where multiple defenders followed him. But again, the spacing prevents an easy layup. Of course, Steph is known for pulling defenders with him in his wake around screens, creating open layups. And Miller was the original master of this, tugging defenders into his orbit to create easy dunks. This never shows up in the stat sheet, but it's high leverage playmaking. And even in the congested spacing of the 90s, these gravitational assists were available every few games. And often in playoff situations, when teams reacted to his scoring outbursts, with three minutes left in Game 7 of the 94 Conference Finals, he curls off a screen and sidesteps into a three to make it a two-point game. With two minutes to play, Starks took away that left block screen, so Miller curls out the other side for a long two to make it a one-point game. And finally, the third time they ran the action, Reggie drew a second defender, and that gravity created the go-ahead layup with 35 seconds left. So we know Miller could stress defenses with his movement and shooting, but was there more to his game? And was he just lucky to play on good teams, or was he actually the driving force that led Indiana to five conference finals in seven years? But to be able to run, shove, grab, fight, back in the day, we run through the butt, butt, backstop. Yep. He did whatever it took to get open. And you knew he was shooting a jump shot. And the bad part about it was, 
you didn't want to file him. Reggie sparked a long line of movement shooters, from Richard Hamilton to Ray Allen and Clay Thompson. But a sizable part of his game actually came off the dribble. Miller liked that classic triple threat position where he could face up and just shoot or put it on the deck and work his way into a pull-up jumper over his defender. His height helped him here because at 6'7", he had a high enough release to shoot over bigger opponents. Reggie was also an early adopter of the step back, yet another shot he hit while moving away from the basket. Miller also had a floater that always looked off balance but was somehow under control, and he could shoot this off one leg or he could lean in off two feet as well. This floater in particular highlights his tough shot making, where he could split a pick and roll, go off the wrong leg and float it off the glass. And he had some serious range on this puppy, pulling up from like 19 feet and drifting it off the window. And this goes back to that body control he has, getting into shots from so many different angles. Reggie could catch and flow into his shot in every direction. And I'm not sure there's ever been a better shooter twisting into shots on the move than Miller. The pass is a bit wide on this one, and so he reverse pivots into a 23-footer, which is insane. And these are all technically assisted field goals, but really they're just difficult scoring moves from Miller on the move. When you look at his shot form, his shooting is even more mind-bending. A traditional technique uses the guide hand to stabilize the ball and the shooting hand to snap the wrist toward the hoop. But Miller uses the thumb on the guide hand to push it, then turns his wrist inwards so his hands clap together. And if you can shoot 92% from the free throw line like that, I think you deserve a private bedroom when you stay at a Wendy's. Maybe it's just me. Now, Reggie couldn't easily go to the mid or low post and generate a high percentage shot on demand, but he could clear out, put it on the floor, and score right over tight coverages at times. He just didn't do this a ton because, well, some of these are really hard shots, and he was probably more efficient creating space with his off-ball movement versus contested shots off the dribble. I think an even bigger reason he was less on ball in his offensive approach was his limited dribbling game. He couldn't always split the pick and roll cleanly like this, and sometimes it just looked like he had butterfingers where he'd lose the ball off his left hand when he felt a little bit of pressure. Take a play like this, where Reggie upfakes past his defender, and there's room to cross over and slither into this space, but he almost never dribbled in traffic. In this one, he breaks out in transition and tries a toothless in-and-out dribble, which throws off his finishing a little. He actually wasn't a great finisher around the basket in traffic either, and some of that was just a lack of verticality on many of these shots. But he also wasn't very bendy and malleable with his body or the ball when he was up in the air. However, Reggie was quick, so he could use that first step for a straight line drive, and defenders had to worry about his shooting, which could briefly expose them to his penetration. Reggie really used that speed in transition, where he turned the game into a track meet and outran slower defenders. He could do this off of makes, he's in the paint when this goes in, then runs a 30-yard dash in under four seconds for a layup. By the way, this is part of why his defensive rebounding numbers were so low. He was always looking to leak out in transition, and since he played with so many good rebounders, he was strategically deployed to take off and run opportunistically. He was also the first star in NBA history to run to the three-point line in transition, and while we often overlook transition offense, this was a dangerous little element in Miller's game. The other thing all that speed does is force teams to foul, and marching to the line was a massive part of Miller's scoring. Here he uses the threat of that transition three to blow by a defender for a friendly playoff foul, and he drew a ton of calls by just hurling himself deep into the paint. 
this is where that up fake into a quick first step puts so much pressure on defenses. And at just 185 pounds, contact bounced him around and was easy to see for officials. I would say he was even better at creating contact on his drives than actually finishing at the rim. He turns the corner here and makes sure to slightly jump into the defender, and that's all it takes to go flying. Miller was an early adopter of leaning into contact on jumpers to draw whistles. He had a primitive version of the rip-through move. He's actually trying to dribble here, but then accentuates the contact when he feels it because Indiana's in the bonus. And he was just a master of feeling a little hit and exaggerating it for the nearest referee. He had a reputation for flopping and embellishing plays, but in the games I watched, most of these were fouls that he just made sure everyone knew about. Despite his limited ball handling, Miller still generated free throws like an elite penetrator, taking over eight attempts every 75 possessions in the playoffs at his peak. In the three-point era, the only guards to make free throws more frequently were James Harden, Dwayne Wade, Michael Jordan, and Russell Westbrook. Huh. Reggie's also known as the inventor of the leg kick, but Doug Collins used to try this in the 70s, and Miller didn't really do it until later in his career. This little leg flare was one of two kicks I saw in all the games I rewatched. Even with his exaggerations, his game just organically generated free throws. When he feels pressure, he picks up the dribble, then goes to the floater when he feels contact. And continuation was much stricter back then. This is a foul on the floor because Kobe did not pick it up before contact. But remember, Miller naturally ended his dribble early and went to the floater. So he ended up with a ton of free throws on jump shots like this. He also used the threat of his shot to set up defenders, throwing an up and under here to just drop it on someone's head. And after this legendary cut where he ran around a screen in a circle, Reggie upfaked Horace Grant into purgatory for more free throws. And watch him grab his own man to create a moving screen that forces Orlando into that switch. Miller had a deep bag of, let's say, not so legal tricks, holding and grabbing to break free, and watch him pull Danny Manning out of the paint on this play to open up a teammate. Here's Reggie explaining his perfectly by the book techniques. So first you wanna kinda of grab a little bit. And you wanna act like you're getting held mm -hmm. when really you're doing the holding. So you're just like, rep, this. Oh, rep. Man. This was all incredibly irritating for opponents, hooking a defender and then accentuating contact for more free throws. And Ty Corbin looks like he's going through the stages of grief. And he wasn't the only one left with emotional vertigo after going through Miller's mind games. Some opponents took out that frustration physically, and he pushed a ton of players past their breaking point including John Starks in the 1993 playoffs. And I was so mad. I mean, like, oh, man, I'd want to just take my fist and just put it right through his face. John Starks in the 1998 playoffs. Kobe Bryant wanted to try some shadow boxing with him one time after a game. And some guy in Chicago snapped and tried to gouge his eyes out. And naturally, Reggie was the only player ejected. The thing is, Miller thrived off this heightened energy, and he would take the physicality and hit right back. This is from the decisive Game 5 against Atlanta in 1996, where Miller played just three weeks after fracturing his eye socket in a collision. He constantly checked in and out of the game, sometimes playing only single possessions to carry an otherwise faltering offense while sucking oxygen on the sideline during breaks. Reggie poured in 29 points in 31 minutes, including 16 of Indiana's final 20 to spark a fourth quarter comeback. And in the final minutes, with the Pacers trailing by two, he launched this 30-foot pull-up to finally put them in the lead. With 10 seconds to play and down by a bucket, they went back to Miller, the Hawks doubled him, and his game winner fell just short, so this game has been lost to history. But it encapsulates how difficult he could be to slow down, 
and how he could raise his game when the time called for it, which might explain why Indiana was so difficult to eliminate in the playoffs. If I had to pick a team that gave us the toughest time in the East, you know, Indiana was probably the toughest outside of Detroit. When contenders from the 1990s are brought up, Miller's Pacers are rarely mentioned, with Clyde Drexler's Blazers, Charles Barkley's Suns, the Sonics, Jazz, or even the Knicks. But Indiana was arguably better than most of these teams in the playoffs. If we look at postseason point differentials and adjust for opponent quality, the mid-90s Pacers have a better three-year run than any of those teams outside of Utah. They were nearly as good again at the end of the decade under coach Larry Bird, and all of these teams look like excellent offenses in the playoffs despite a lack of star power. The early 90s Pacers were already really good offensively, but they never made it out of the first round due to their lackluster defense. So on the eve of the 1994 season, new coach Larry Brown traded their second best offensive player, three-time All-Star Detlef Schrempf, for a versatile defender named Derek McKee. The 7'4 Rick Smits emerged as a second scoring weapon next to Miller, giving them a high-end post-up option to balance Miller's movement-heavy actions. With Antonio and Dale Davis, Indiana added more rebounding and defense around Miller and Smits, and suddenly they were difficult to eliminate for just about anyone. To offset Shrimp's offensive loss, Brown ran more screening actions for Miller while teammates waited for him to scramble the defense. And McKee was such a great fit because he had some serious passing chops himself. This gave Indiana a little more playmaking, especially outside the paint. And critically, when Miller or Smiths were doubled, it gave them a fantastic extra passer. I love their synergy. Smiths is doubled in the post, quickly hits McKee, who can use Miller's shooting threat to fake out this defender, and then Smiths ends up cleaning up on the rebound. So those pacers could flow from Miller's screening actions right into a single coverage post up for Smiths, or they could run Reggie around a series of picks and McKee could take advantage of Miller's gravity. This passing was so helpful because neither Smiths nor Miller were strong distributors. Reggie's open there and they'd mostly hit basic passes instead of more advanced skip passes so McKee could be the one to move it along to the open man in those situations. Miller's ball handling probably hurt his on-ball playmaking, but he also just misses Smiths on the cut here for a less potent kick out. This is where Curry was able to extend the blueprint beyond off-ball movement. Steph added elite ball handling that turned him into an unheard of pull-up threat and that ball handling security freed up mental space for really good passing too. Compare that to Reggie, who uses more processing power to set up this crossover, so he completely misses Smith running free to the rim and ends up doing it himself anyway. Miller was always a very willing passer who understood the right play, but he was more of a reactionary passer rather than someone who anticipated openings. In transition here, he doesn't realize a teammate is going to outrun everyone down the court, so he never pulls the trigger on it, and he's much more comfortable with a pass like that when he can actually see it open up like this. Here's a trickier version in the half court where Antonio Davis is briefly open, and this requires anticipating the double or that cut into open space, and nothing happens, so they just reset. I do think Miller's passing improved a little as the decade progressed. He's bothered by some pressure here around a screen and just completely misses an open shooter. But six years later in pick and roll, he's able to read the slip and throw it over the top nicely. I think he was a little more under control on drives in those later years. And by 93 or 94, he always looked for an early pocket pass in pick and roll situations, which could free up a shooter or get the roll man headed downhill. 
even with his passing limitations, he could still create offense for teammates with all that attention he drew. Teams were worried about his shooting, so sometimes just a basic kick out generated wide open offense. This blended into his off-ball game, where he'd fly off a screen and draw extra defenders, and simple passes set up easy shots. On this curl action, he learned to hit the screener over the years, although he was inconsistent with this pass, sometimes misreading the play like this. But when he started taking over games down the stretch, teams would send multiple defenders at him to force someone else to beat them. With the Pacers down three in the final game against the Bucks, Milwaukee sends half the city out to defend him, leading to this wide open three to tie the game. And in the waiting seconds of this playoff game in Orlando, the Magic play a game of anybody but Reggie, which frees up Byron Scott for the win. Yes! Miller is known for his endless clutch theatrics, both at the buzzer and down the stretch of key games, where his stone-cold shooting so often put Indiana in front. And for whatever reason, he ramped up his aggression in the playoffs. There are moments when I'm watching him and wondering why he doesn't look to score, and then I realize I'm watching a regular season game. Because in the postseason, he was constantly hunting weaknesses and pushing the issue, which spiked his playoff scoring compared to his regular season numbers. When we adjust for opponent quality, Miller looks like one of the very best scorers in all of NBA history. Only Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and maybe Dirk Nowitzki can match his volume and efficiency over a sustained stretch. And what's even more mind-blowing is that Miller has another five-year run later in his career that's close to Curry's peak playoff scoring and still looks better than someone like Charles Barkley at his peak. Back then, no one noticed how prolific he was as a scorer because most published stats were about the regular season where Miller scored an incredible five fewer points per game during these peak years. We don't have plus minus data in the playoffs for those mid 90s seasons, but we do have it for the regular season back to 1994. And Miller looks like a big impact player on good teams but short of the very best. Fittingly, that outlier in the upper right is Steph Curry, who took the Miller archetype to new heights. The playoff plus minus we do have for Reggie at the end of his career looks similar in impact, but I wonder if it's more impressive at his peak given those incredible scoring numbers. In 94-95, the Pacers were just 2-9 and nine when his true shooting was under 55%, but when it was over 55%, they went an incredible 18 and four. Either way, his playoff scoring and off ball movement were the centerpiece of some of the most successful offenses of the decade. And even though he wasn't fully appreciated back then, Reggie Miller paved the road for future generations and was an offensive legend who was truly ahead of his time. If you want more content, check out our extra channel, More Thinking Basketball. You can find our full podcast episodes up there. It's a great way to comment and interact with our shows. And we also have extra videos and shorts that don't make this main channel. You can also support us at patreon.com slash thinking basketball directly. We have a ton of stats and extra content there too. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching this one all the way through. And of course, I hope you're having... A great day.